ok uh, students good morning. So, this week we are discussing how we can use NMR in drug discovery and last class I was discussing how we can use NMR in drug metabolism understanding the drug metabolism. Why it is important to understand the drug metabolism as we discussed in the last lecture that the drug starts its journey from mouth and when it reaches to the cell where it has to act it remains only say 15 to 20 percent or very less because it has to pass through first pass metabolism and this can vary from person to person because the enzymes that degrades the or metabolize these drugs the cytochrome P450 family can be expressed differently in a different person. So, in a healthy person it can have one dose or one effective concentration or we call it bioavailable concentration bioavailability and in diseased person or different person it can be different. Therefore, to understand the fate of the drug how it, it, uh, it travels from the site of administration to the site of action is comes uh, does that comes under drug metabolism or pharmacokinetic. That is very important to understand to define a dosage because it can one dose cannot fit for all and that will not treat the patient effectively. So, NMR plays a significant role in understanding in a quantitative manner this drug metabolism or pharmacokinetic how that we are going to do now. Uh, discuss now, but last class we looked at that there are some enhancer that probably enhances the bioavailability. I showed you the example like if phenylalanine is taken um, like here, uh, if this drug um, is is uh, which is for blood pressure, if it is taken with the fruit juice, phenylalanine is taken with a grape fruit juice it increases the bioavailability you can see it here and that is what uh, we concluded and it actually helps in uh, having um, pronounced effect. So, <clears throat> plasma phenylalanine concentration also varies depending upon the, uh, the cytochrome C450 CYP3A4 activity. So, in patient with increased activity the bioavailable concentration in plasma is very less compared to healthy. Therefore, understanding this drug metabolism in a quantitative manner is of paramount importance. So, let us look at where NMR can help us, right. So, as you know NMR is non-invasive technique. <coughs> Therefore, it, it perturbs like minimally and can, can be used for drug metabolism. What we can take from body for understanding the drug metabolism any biofluids which can be urine, the plasma, serum, tears, sweat, anything that, that comes under biofluid. We can take our tissue extract or biopsy sample or even intact cell can be taken. These are the in vitro approach we can do it like take out these and record the NMR spectrum in vitro condition or even one can do in vivo condition you can take whole animal model or a human subject that is a uh, sister um, technique of MRI, NMR called MRI. You can use these uh, two techniques spectroscopy plus imaging to understand the drug metabolism in, in totality. So, that is a in vivo uh, use of NMR spectroscopy to understand the drug metabolism and it has a unique ability because it permits both kind of study in vitro as well as in vivo. So, like whole organism can be taken into the NMR magnet or MRI magnet and understand the drug metabolism and of course, in vitro one can do with biofluids to tissue extract so and so forth. So, what it allows one to do? One can generate a metabolic signature of the drug, right? what kind of like uh, what kind of metabolites comes out of a drug one can understand this. It not only identify, but it measures the metabolic flux like a, when drug goes through different cycle of different stage of metabolism, how the flux is changing, how, how the like a flow of the drug is changing that can 
NMR can monitor as well as measure it quantitatively. It also many, uh, monitors the enzyme like some of the enzyme that we talked in the last class, what is the activity of enzyme right. So, uh, once drug is ad administered, enzymes comes into play how fast or how slow they are metabolizing you one can understand. So, one can actually decipher the pathway or kinetic pathway of drug metabolism and uh, one can even monitor what kind of modification that happens in the metabolic path uh, when drug is administered or get metabolized. Does, the, uh, does drug make any adduct or it combines with some other molecules when it gets metabolized. So, <coughs> essentially it can understand the effect of perturbants or toxins or any other things when drug goes from the site of administered to the circulation. So, one can study all these or excretion, we, one can study all of these. So, typically the fluids that are used for doing the in vitro study um, like a diagnostic fluids, plasma can be used, serum can be used, urine can be used, saliva or any other secretion even tears can be used for understanding uh, the NMR like a drug metabolism using NMR spectroscopy in a non-invasive manner. One of the prominent one is a urine, why? Because whatever we take or consume as a drug finally it should be excreted and most of the things excreted out from urine right. So, and like a taking urine is a minimal painful right, everybody urinates easily you one can take urine identify the drug metabolism for like a pl taking plasma or serum you have to take blood right. So, not people or patients uh, like it, it is not a patient compliance uh, body fluid. However, urine comes in, in, in enough quantity and that can be used critically to understand how the drug metabolism happens. So, everything that goes through kidney comes in urine and that can be used for detecting the drug metabolism. Right. So, uh, other than these body fluids if you want to do understand how drugs is reaching to different uh, specialized location like a cerebral a spinal a spinal um, location or thyroids or saliva um, whether it is sublingual or parotid or multi uh, sub maxillary or gastric uh, location or even bile juices or pancreatic juices lots of these can be done with a localized NMR spectroscopy or even amniotic fluid follicular or in milk how drug is uh, going into milk um, you know like a milk contamination is one of the major ones. So, like uh, for um, babies mother's milk is very important. So, generally one want to know that if what is the effect of drug on milk or even sem uh, seminal vesicles how drug is affecting whether it is going or prosthetic many of such things can be understand by NMR spectroscopy. The effect of a drug or the location of a drug metabolites can be identified by taking these um, body fluids and understanding using um, these drug metabolites in a quantitative manner. So, what nuclei one can use for studying the, the drug metabolism? So, see all the nuclei that we have studied can be exploited. The prominent one is a hydrogen right, it is it's a half spin and it is natural abundance right. So, uh, the chemical shift range, range is about 15 ppm, this is actually everywhere present, but there are some drawbacks with a hydrogen, we will discuss that. But you require a minimal concentration like in, in say 0 0.01 millimolar. The other one is deuterium, then come lithium, boron, right, uh, carbon 13, carbon 13 can also be taken from the body fluids and can be exploited. Then it is a N14, N15, O17, all these are NMR active nuclei, like a fluorine is a, it is a precious nuclei that is used for understanding the drug metabolism. Similarly, 31P it is a natural abundance 
uh, found in a many like uh, if a nucleic acid, the bones and all those it can be used. So, these are some of the nuclei that can be exploited. So, let us go a little more detail and understand the pros and cons of each of these nuclei it can be used for understanding the drug metabolism. So, as we know proton is present in all drugs, mostly in all drugs and it has a highest sensitivity. The natural abundance for protein, uh, proton is about 99.98, so it is a 100 percent natural abundance you can consider this. So, this is the most prominent nuclei that can be exploited, but there are some problem associated with the pro proton or hydrogen. It's a, it has a small chemical shift range of about 15 ppm and then because of the J coupling you see extensive multiplicity. So, that actually makes the spectrum crowded okay. and quantification of drug metabolites in those cases can be difficult. Right. So, because of short chemical shift range and extensive multiplicity due to coupling, homonuclear coupling makes spectral really crowded. So, quantification or even the distinguishing the drug metabolites can be difficult. The another big problem that whatever body fluid you take, the water is huge about 70 percent of all these will have will be dominated by water. Now, you want to detect a very low concentration of drug from the body fluid where water is very high. Other than water, there are proteins or lipids that are there. So, before you start experiment, you have to think about how we can get rid of proteins or lipid signal or reduce at least if you cannot eliminate. So, there are techniques, NMR based technique that you saw for proteins like you can do water suppression preset or gradient based uh, gradient based actually suppression you can do it or to to like concentrate more you can do freeze drying by using the T2 filters you can remove the signal of proteins or lipids. So, these are some tricks that can be utilized for getting the signal of protons for protons from the drug metabolites in presence of a huge amount of water, protein and lipids. So, these are some of the tricky experiment like a, some, some of the trick that can be applied and then one can detect the protons. Now, not only in vitro even one can use proton in vivo, but it comes with some problem and those are the problem because it is a poor nuclei for in vivo monitoring of drug because the, the tissue, tissue inhomogeneity is there. And in, in, the in vivo you are you cannot spin sample or they are not fast mo mobile right. So, this averaging of an isotropic interaction is not that prominent. Therefore, lines are bound to be broad due to tissue inhomogeneity, heterogeneity or restricted molecular mobility because tissue cannot be like a spin faster or, or all those. And it can also be done because the, the tissue size can be like a little bigger than the whatever we have the homogeneous magnetic field. So, magnetic field inhomogeneity can come in, in, in this case because relatively large sample volume and use of lower magnetic field makes little bit difficult. You cannot put whole organism in a huge magnet of 20 tesla, you have to restrict to 3 tesla, 4 tesla. In those case, you do not want to perturb this ecosystem of a organism by exposing to high magnetic field. So, typically we, we do this experiment at a lower magnetic field and in those lower magnetic field, the homogeneous space is limited. However, our tissue or the whole organism that we are scanning can be bigger. So, magnetic field inhomogeneity is invariably there and that basically broadens the signal. So, in vivo signal line width are substantially broader than what we obtained in, in in vitro and those are the some of the limitation of using proton for in vivo drug metabolism experiment. The another important and beautiful nuclei is fluorine 19. So, you know fluorine is, is interesting nuclei first of all it is a it is nuclear spin is half has a relatively narrow line shape it is a 100 percent natural abundance and very high sensitive like about 83 percent of proton. So, you can see it is a sensitive 
it is a natural abundance is also high and gives sharp lines. You do not need to do anything special because it is it is a not a quadrupolar nuclei, it is a half uh, uh, half integral nuclei, one spin is only half. So, one can detect it. Other than this, it has a large chemical shift range. So, peaks cannot be crowded, it is about 200 uh, ppm line uh, chemical shift. So, peaks will be separated. So, you can identify this and additional advantage it has, it has a short longitudinal relaxation time. So, you know if T1 is short that means you can afford to keep D1 also short. So, experiment can be performed on a fast scale. The only requirement is you need to have a probe that can detect fluorine. Once you have the probe, NMR probe where you can tune your uh, RF to F19, you can do these experiments in a much cleaner manner and much beautiful manner. So, if we have this one can do the rapid pulsing and you can incre increase the signal to noise ratio in per unit time in a quicker time. So, and many drugs are actually fluorinated, a large number of drugs are fluorinated that are in clinical use. For those drugs NMR F19 NMR offers a powerful methods for monitoring their pharmacokinetic and metabolism. So, F19 uh, remember it F19 is a beautiful nuclei to be used for understanding the drug metabolism and pharmacokinetic. Next is 13 C right so 13 C you know for proteins it is widely used. Now, in this case uh, drugs cannot be isotopically labeled most of the time. So, the only one one has to rely on 1.1 percent of natural abundance of, of the carbon 13 in any drug, but it has a large chemical shift. So, basically actually uh, if we can signal average to a large number of scan, it can produce actually a reliable chemical structure for identifying the drug molecule right. Or one can isotopically label to enhance the signal to noise. But that is typically cannot be done so easily because drugs cannot be isotopically labeled in a in a for all practical purpose. However, for research purpose one can do it and then detect it. So, uh, mostly we have to rely on a natural abundance um, that is 1.1 percent. Right? So, there are other tricks that one can apply. What are those tricks? Basically what we can do is like we detect on carbon 13 but we transfer the polarization from proton in a head core kind of experiment and uh, uh, then we can like do this kind of detection. So, we can improve the sensitivity by doing this polarization transfer experiment and then you can use this drug um, like a, you can understand this drug metabolism using head core kind of experiment. Okay. And now 13 C can be used in vitro as well as in vivo. And um, however, actually it is of very limited use because of its sensitivity, but yes it can be used. The another important nuclei for drug metabolism can be phosphorus 31. The good part is that it is a 100 percent natural abundance, it is a gyromagnetic ratio is about one third of protons. So, it is a significantly sensitive and phosphate is found in, in many individual like in many. Um, drugs or even in the body. So, one can look at the phosphorus signal. So, indigenous phosphate and derivatives like a phospho, um, phospho monoesters or phospho diesters, many of these, these uh, can interfere from the signal of phosphorylated drugs and it metabolites. So, one had to really identify what is coming from the drug and what is coming from our uh, system. But yes, uh, it can be used and there are many phosphorus containing drugs, uh, not too many phosphorus containing drugs. So, they are fairly rare, but conceptually phosphorus 31 can also be used. Other than that, there are some other nuclei which can probably use. Now, lithium based drugs are uh, used for bipolar disorder or so. So, lithium 7 can be used, boron 10, 11 can be used that deuterium, tritium, many of O17, N15, N14, 
platinum right platinum based drugs are basically used in, in cancer treatment. So, actually one can use platinum 195 for understanding the drug metabolism in case of cancerous tissue. So, NMR offers a wide range of nuclei, a wide range of possibility to be used for drug metabolism and few of the example we are going to understand. But before we delve into few of the example, let us see what are the traditional techniques that are used for metabolic analysis. So, these are low resolution, uh, I would say not uh, low resolution, it is also high resolution techniques called HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, the capillary electrophoresis, mass spectroscopy, all of these are typically used. They require good part of them that they require minimum volume, NMR requires a significant volume. However, they may be getting perturbed with a column matrix uh, or like a depending upon retention time so or depending upon solvent use. So, lots of possibility of modification that can come because of the nature of the experiment. The good part of NMR that you are not perturbing any sample. However, it requires larger volume and it is less sensitive compared to these techniques HPLC, GC, C, NMS. But these are traditionally used in a quantitative manner to understand the pharmacokinetic use and these are like a widely used NMR has is picking up now. Right. What are the problems of these traditional methods? They require separation, you have to separate that and then identify. So, these are coupled methodology can be used. It requires optimization for separation, you cannot just take your sample and go and put in the HPLC and get your data, that is not the case for NMR. So, here you need to optimize when your retention like uh, looking at the retention time when your metabolite is coming. So, some optimization is required right and many times you have to separate it like uh, you have to separate a polar metabolites from non polar metabolites smaller from bigger all these you have to do. So, typically it takes time and these are slow uh, techniques right. And basically you have to do lots of um, like a lots of supervision, you require high skill, it is a tedious, so manually intensive process all these are HPLC, C, uh, GCMS, all these are like a manually intensive process. Now on the other hand NMR based drug metabolism study, it is a high throughput, you can use automatic uh, sampler, auto sampler, put all the metabolites in one go 48, 24 whatever put it for overnight go and have a rest. Next day morning your results are there. The good part it is a high resolution, minimal effort you need for sample preparation. You just have to take your sample add D2O for locking and then you are ready to go. So, you require a really minimal sample preparation. So, high throughput, high resolution and less effort, less effort on sample preparation. An advantage is it is a quantitative, looking at the peak intensity you can integrate those peak intensity and you can get the quantity of each of these metabolites that come out. Non-destructive you can use same sample for doing even LCMS, GCMS. So, after doing experiment you can take same sample and use orthogonal technique to understand whatever we are getting in NMR is correct or not right. So, you can be you can be doubly sure using these samples. So, it is a non-destructive same sample can be used and one metabolites can be detected uh, simultaneously in a single experiment. Right? So, you do not need to separate it uh, or isolate it. it, it can be used in a single analysis and it gives structural as well as quantitative information. Right? So, what kind of a structure of metabolites is coming looking at the chemical shift pattern, you can identify their structure and also looking at the intensity you can quantify and get the quantitative estimate of each of the metabolites. For few of the there is a no um, significant for few of the nuclei there is no or little spectral interference coming from the endogenous molecule like F19 or 31P or lithium or carbon 13 you have a very minimal interference. However, for protons we have interference as we discussed from coming from water, coming from protein, coming from lipid, you can have an interference from these um, nuclei. 
So, how you go about sample preparation? Suppose you are doing a experiment with one of the body fluid called plasma. So, you have to take about 300 microliter of plasma, add uh, buffer 300 microliter, you have 600 microliter. So, typically this is plasma and here is buffer where you have a H2O, uh, TSP for internal reference, the sodium azide for like so that bacterial growth does not happen and some buffer and then uh, you need to have a D2O, right. So, typically buffer concentration you can take some of these, you do not need to centrifugation or shaking, but can, because that can form bubble or foam, you just do this, take your experiment like your experimental setup is ready, go and record the NMR. So, you can see minimal sample preparation. If you are doing with a urine, just take urine of about 90 percent and add D2O sodium azide TSP for internal reference, sodium azide so that bacterial growth does not happen and you are all set to record experiment, right. So, again re-emphasizing the fact that we are doing minimal sample preparation while recording the spectrum of these and you do not need very high magnet on a moderate magnet like a 500 megahertz, 600 megahertz one can do experiment. Typically experiments are very easy like 1D <coughs> noji with pre-saturation of mixing time of 10 millisecond for urine you can do or even CPMG one can do <coughs> with a CPMG delay of 200, 300 millisecond and echo time of 200 millisecond uh, one can use it for plasma. Temperature typically you can have 298 room temperature and you do not need much scan just 32 like within a minutes experiment will be done uh, and you can like uh, here what this is because of water and coming from those. So, you have to get rid of water. So, you put like uh, you suppress the water or put a spectral region to 0 and you record few of the experiment like a 2D to have more dispersion like HSQC with some scans of 160 because you are you can get a better signal to noise. In one go 1D or 2D whatever you record you are getting all the information from the body fluids. So, typically what we get? We get a spectral like this. So, suppose we are getting taking the human urine you have lots of a spectrum like this. Looking at the database you can identify that these peaks are coming from glutamate, glutamine, betaine or glycine right. So, these are typically dominated. Now, we know from healthy patient that how the signature comes from the uh, healthy urine. Now, if we are administering drug and what extra peaks comes that you need to identify right. So, let us take some of the example of how we can do that. So, one healthy patient was given this drug called flu Fluorbiprofen, uh, it is an anti inflammatory drug. The spectra were recorded on 600 megahertz. So, you see, you can exploit two nuclei here, at least two nuclei. One is proton that you can record the spectrum and you can find it out, right. The another nuclei is beautifully located here, fluorine, it is a cleaner one. If you are detecting on fluorine, you have only signal coming from this drug and you can identify each metabolites, each path that it travel. However, for proton it will be little difficult because it is it's lots of indigenous signal will come from urine. So, on 600 megahertz a sample of urine was collected after oral ingestion of 200 mg of, of this drug and then spectra were recorded, right. So, now, the problem is lots of uh, complication was coming. So, one can do it, one can actually couple the HPLC with NMR and you separate many of these uh, whatever is coming depending upon the retention time and you can identify what happens after the drug is, is, is given. So, what has happened that once drug was administered, the drug made some kind of conjugate with um, um, the beta d glucuronic acid and that basically was also detected in the NMR spectrum. So, de depending upon like how the metabolites went, what they found in the previous slide that two diastomeric form of bet beta d glucuronic acid conjugate 
of 40 hydroxy fluorobrufen was there and the resonance could be identified to resonance at 6.91 and 4.72 and other aromatic complex was coming at 7.19. So, using this signature one can identify that where these are coming. So, for this drug the resonances came at, at the 5.49 you can see somewhere here the signals were coming very high uh, sorry uh, not in this probably in this. So, yeah some, somewhere here the signals were coming uh, from the drug. Okay. So, and the other signal come from from the d glutaronic acid were located between 3 to 6 ppm. So, one can identify all these resonances and this paper that I was referring they actually analyze all these and identify that how the drug table wha what adduct it made and uh, the good part that this example emphasizes on that if we can couple HPLC with NMR one can identify all sorts of modification happens. So, first you purify using HPLC and then go and record NMR and that gives wealth of information in this case. The another example that I want to show you is use of 13 C NMR for drug metabolism study. So, these, these are the drugs. So, um, phenacetine and phenatidine. So, basically these were administered and af after one hour of administration basically the the carbon 13 NMR was recorded from the healthy sample and also from hepatitis B suffering pa patient. So, you just look at the spectrum that is there and TSP was used for internal reference. You can see lots of modification is happening, lots of extra peaks are coming and that helps us in identifying what is the fit, how the two uh, person respond. So, you can see the peaks differences that are coming here and additional peak that appeared at 66.9 ppm. So, one can quantify it and look at the effect of this drug on a normal person on a, a person who is suffering from acute hepatitis. So, these two examples demonstrate the application of NMR in understanding the drug metabolism in a quantitative manner. And next class I will be uh, discussing how we can use NMR spectroscopy for in vivo detection of a drug metabolism. Uh, till then I think uh, it will be good to have questions from you. So, looking forward for a healthy discussion over question answer session. Thank you very much.